mitigate and help regulate uh, fuel pressures. And KE Jetronic uses this little gym, the electrohydraulic actuator, oops, which is controlled by one of these, the KE Jetronic or CISE control unit. So we're going to review some of the stuff from, from our last presentation. But if you haven't watched the last presentation, I suggest that you do so because it's going to give you some discussion about the fuel pump relay and some discussion about you know fuel distributors and how they work. We're gonna to try to rehash as much material as possible, but you know, I, I strongly suggest just so you have a background to watch the the uh, last video. Uh, so before I start a little bit about myself, I own a Mercedes repair shop in Titusville, Florida. I've been an MBCA member consistently since 2008. I've provided technical advice and help for Mercedes Benz, for classic Mercedes Benz owners all over the country. And I own a bunch of classic Mercedes myself. I also am on YouTube for some of you that may have seen me there. I have a channel called Mercedes Classics with Pierre Hidari. So I really like these cars and I really love the MBCA. If it was not for the MBCA, I probably would not have a business. So this is my way of paying it forward to the club. I think that the biggest thing that you guys can do for the MBCA is help us recruit members. If you know somebody with a classic Mercedes or a Mercedes that they're really enthusiastic about, get them to join our club because our membership is not going to grow without grassroots effort. So this is my personal contribution to making the MBCA a, a great value for the $55 a year that it costs. What I hope is that you guys are able to take away something great from this presentation. So let's begin. This time I upped my game a little bit and I went big. I brought an entire fuel distributor airflow meter assembly from a 560 SL with me. And actually, this is a car right now that I am doing some work on. And so we're going to go and look at the parts of this system as well as the peripheral items that are, uh, that are necessary. So this is the entire KE injection unit. This is how fuel is delivered to the engine. This is the eight cylinder version. In case you're curious, here's a six plunger version. And what is this part called? This is the fuel distributor. Now, I'm going to go in and, and talk about these parts and how they work together. But first we have to get all of our terminology figured out. So this is the fuel distributor. This is the electrohydraulic actuator, which regulates the control pressure. The control pressure is the fuel pressure that is fed through these eight lines, not this line, but these eight lines to the injectors. This part right here is the airflow meter. This is the idle mixture adjuster. This is the cold start injector, which allows us to start the engine. This guy right here on the end is the idle air valve. And then we also have uh, some other parts that are not in the picture. We've got our fuel pumps. Boom. Usually these cars have two of them. We have our KE control unit. We have our oxygen sensor. We have our old and new version over voltage relays. We have an idle air valve from an M102 or M103 engine. And we have our fuel pressure gauges so I can teach you how to hook them up, how to make adjustments, and most importantly, 
how to read pressures. Now, before I launch into all the heavy technical stuff, I'm going to tell you where KE Jetronic was actually used and on what cars it was applied on. Starting in 1984, when Mercedes launched the W201 chassis, the 190E, all gasoline versions of the 190E, not the plain 190 with the carburetor, just the 190E, so 190E 2.3, 2.3 16 valve, and 2.6, all used KE Jetronic. All gasoline 124 models up to 1992, or if you happen to have a 93 300TE formatic, but 1986 to 92 124 models all used KE Jetronic. This includes the 260E and 300E, TE, and CE variants. The 126 and 107 chassis uh, gasoline cars all received KE Jetronic starting in the 1986 model year and continuing to the end of production. So the 107 used KE on the 560 SL in the United States from 1986 to 89, and the 126 used it on 300, 420, and 560 variants until the end of production in 1991. In addition, R129 models, 1990 to 92, 300 SL and 500 SL used KE Jetronic. And if you have a W463 chassis, a Galinda wagon, gasoline version up to 1993, a 300 GE or 230 GE, uh, these used, uh, th used KE Jetronic as well. Uh, the 500 GE also used KE Jetronic and Finally, the, um, there were some other non-Mercedes cars that used KE, and these included the Ferrari uh, Testarossa, uh, the, there were some Rolls Royces that used it, uh, and there were also uh, Lotus used it. So a lot of other manufacturers used it. So if you have another car besides a Mercedes, you uh, or a friend that has a car like this, you might you might benefit from this information. So let's start from the back. Now in the last presentation I did, I talked about the fuel pump relay, a little square black relay that, uh, that, that tr turns on the fuel pumps. These fuel pumps again are located at the back of the car in a bracket that is purely visible, but instead of one fuel pump, some, but not all KE cars used two pumps. Cars that used a single pump include the 190E 2.3, early versions of the 300E in 1986, the 300SE 126 and uh, SEL 126, the 190, early versions of the 190E 16 valve, and I think the 260E used one fuel pump, but all the V8 cars and later versions of the 300E all use dual fuel pumps. So if one fuel pump goes down, the system will not work right because one fuel pump failing will create an obstruction in the fuel flow. Fuel does not flow readily through these pumps because they each have a check valve at the end. So both of them have to be working for the car to function. Now the car may die when it's in drive or idle roughly. It might start if the uh, first pump, which sucks fuel from the tank and then pushes it to the second pump uh, is working and the second pump doesn't, but there has to be enough fuel pressure to pop the check valves open. These cars also have fuel pressure accumulators. The accumulator is a, uh, is a pressure storage reservoir. I covered it in the last presentation. So if you're curious about what it looks like or what it does, again, it is covered in the last presentation. But one caveat is that fuel pressure accumulator failure is less common on KE Jetronic cars than on K-Jet cars. I'm still not sure why, but it might be an age-related thing. Now we do occasionally get 
KE Jetronic cars with bad fuel accumulators, but it's not as common. And of course, you have your fuel filter. If your fuel filter has not been changed recently, let's say in the past 30,000 miles or 10 years, it's a good idea to change it and it lives in the back by the fuel pumps. Now, let's look at our fuel delivery systems and then we're going to go to the electronic governing. To make things simple, I have a standalone fuel distributor from a 300E and the basis of this system is extremely simple. What you have is a fuel delivery orifice and this has a little filter in it. So if you have a car that's been sitting for a long time, it might benefit you to remove and clean this filter. The fuel goes into this bottom chamber. You can see that's sort of like an ice cream sandwich. This thing is a top and a bottom. And then of course there's a return port. There's a return from the uh, fuel. This is the trim port that goes to the fuel pressure regulator. And then the cold start injector has its own port up here that pressurizes the cold start injector, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And of course, we have the mounting fixture here for the electrohydraulic actuator. There are O-rings that are supposed to go in these two holes. And there's a screw hole here and a screw hole here. Underneath, Oh look, I got I got Mr. Van Zant on here. Oh boy, I've got important people watching. Okay. Under here, we have this little gym. This is the uh, this is the uh, this is the fuel delivery piston. And when the airflow meter plate is depressed, come on, plate depressed. This little roller in here pushes on this piston right here in the middle. You see that little pintle? It pushes on it. And as it pushes on it, it allows fuel to be delivered through these holes. That's why I say if you have a no start condition, you could always jump the fuel pump relay. So you have fuel circulating, push on the plate, and see if fuel starts coming out of these six little holes. Great stuff, huh? Anyway, we're going to get to the peripheral parts of the fuel distribution system now. Ah. I think Bruce is awake. So, this thing is so heavy, man. Can't wait to do DJetronic injection. This is the passenger side of the fuel distributor system. And this is the this is the driver side. Mercedes set this up in six cylinder cars so that there would always be easy access. Let's see here, I'm trying to use some additional lighting here. All right, Mercedes set this up so there would always be good access to repair this stuff. So this is the electrohydraulic actuator. As you can see, it mounts on the side of the fuel distributor. And this is the guy that regulates. There's a plug right here where it plugs into the wiring harness. This is the fuel pressure regulator. And the fuel pressure regulator, just so you know, it's not the same between dual fuel pump and single fuel pump cars. So if you have like an 86300E and then you, you need a fuel pressure regulator and you put one on from a 1990 300E, they're not the same. These guys are regulated to somewhere between 6.4 and 6.8 bar of pressure. Whereas if you have a single fuel pump car, it's regulated to around 5.5, uh, 5.1 to 5.5 bar of pressure. So 
uh, it's basically designed to operate at a much lower pressure than a uh, you know the, the the single the single fuel pump cars operate at a much lower pressure than the dual fuel pump cars. So the dual fuel pump cars uh, had better fuel atomization, and because they could operate at a higher pressure, it meant that the fuel mixture could be trimmed a little bit better. You'd have better throttle response, et cetera, but you also had better emissions because anytime you can get fuel pressures up, then you're going to you're going to get a better uh, you're going to get a better mixture. Now, moving on through the system, when you need to start the car cold, you're going to need a cold start injector. And this cold start injector, believe it or not, Elaine. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit that button. I need to push it down. This cold start injector is going to be fed directly from a port on the fuel distributor. Let's get this front and center. So I want you to pay close attention to this line. I want you guys to pay close attention to this line because this is not regulated the same as this line right here. This is raw working pressure. Working pressure is the pressure directly from your fuel pumps. These guys right here, these eight lines are all regulated with control pressure, which is the pressure that is mitigated by the electrohydraulic actuator. Now, of course, we have idle air valve. And on V8 cars, the idle air valve is regulated by a, uh, by a relay that looks a lot like the, the, the newer version fuel pump relay. It's located, if you have a 560 SL, it's located on underneath the false floor on the passenger side. Sorry, um, it's located on the firewall in the relay pack behind the glove box in a 560 SL. If you have a 420 SEL or a uh, or a three uh, or, or a 560 SEL, it's located underneath the false floor in the passenger side. These units are pretty damn near bulletproof. They don't have a ton of issues. Now we're going to talk about some of the electronic regulation. These are KE control units and one is a four cylinder version and one is a six cylinder version. There were some of these that came in metal cases starting in 1990 for six cylinder cars or for the R129. Now, there are some assumptions that people make about these. And they assume that if you have an eight cylinder, see how it says eight ZYL, if you have an eight cylinder version, it'll work on any eight cylinder car. And sure, yeah, it'll kind of sort of work, but not that's not always the truth. Because if you have, let's say you have a 560 SL, let's take a 1988 560 SL. If you have a federal version versus a California version, you can't exchange these control units and get all of your functions. You're not gonna get proper voltage to the EHA, you're not gonna get proper diagnostic voltage, and you're not gonna get proper check engine light circuitry. Ditto with the six cylinder versions. It's pretty obvious, but and it's not totally obvious, but six cylinder cars are going to have a huge variance in their control unit based on whether you have an M103 or M104 engine, based on whether you have a manual transmission or an automatic, based on whether you have a California market car or a 260E or a 300E or a car with an early car with a single fuel pump versus a later car with dual fuel pump. So your best bet is to use Mercedes EPC, which is on StarTech Info. Uh, if, if you Google 
Mercedes EPC, the StarTech info site will come up that has the electronic parts catalog, the EPC. And you can actually track your Mercedes number through the EPC and see what is compatible with your car. Now, the KE control unit is powered up by these guys, the over voltage relays. This is an early over voltage relay. It was used up until 1989 on certain models. And during the 1989 model year, this bigger over voltage relay was phased in. The little OVP was used on, uh, was used starting on 190Es and uh, also 380SLs, 500SELs. We talked about it a little bit in the last presentation, but it, it soldiered on until 1989 on federal version 560SLs. The bigger OVP was phased in in 1989. It had more pins. It performed the same function. Um, these, these units have, some of these units have two fuses in the top. Some have a single fuse, but it's always a good idea to check your little 10 amp fuse. They're missing out of here, but you should always check your little 10 amp fuse if you get a sudden failure. And we're, we're, um, where these are located, if you have a 190E or a 300E, 260E, these are gonna be behind the battery. There's a plastic shield behind the battery and that's where they're gonna be found. If you have a 126, they're real easy to spot. They're gonna be located in the false firewall next to the fuel pump relay and the Klima relay. So this area is like a, 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 a rift in between the first engine firewall and the second engine firewall. And in that space, just to the left of the brake booster, you're going to see this red top unit right next to your fuel pump relay. So the red top is the dead giveaway. Finally, on the 107 chassis, and these are the trickiest to get to, these are gonna be located on sticking out on the side of the inner fender above the fuse box. So unless you're used to doing this a million times, you'll have to pull your lower dash panel and it'll be stuck right in its plug, pointing towards the center of the car, right above the fuse grid with all the, um, with all the wiring connections. And that's where this OVP will be living. If you have a Galinda wagon, you're going to drop your lower dash panel on the right side. And that's where this thing will be living. It'll be living in the wiring, uh, wiring harness uh, connection area below the right side of the dash. Uh, and, and again, uh, it's, it's not super obvious, but once you get in there, then it should be apparent. So, I think we've covered most of our components. There are two other components that I need to mention that I do not have. Actually, no, I have one of them here, sorry. The oxygen sensor, which provides the feedback for the electrohydraulic actuator so that the KE control unit, which works at the oxygen sensor, which works at the EHA, can make decisions about, uh, about what the fuel mixture needs to be. The throttle switch, which takes feedback from where the throttle is. I, I don't have one. Uh, here we go, this guy again. The airflow meter potentiometer, which watches the position of the airflow meter. And uh, the throttle micro switch on six cylinder cars, which basically tells this idle air valve when it can shut on and off. So if you have a six cylinder car with a high idle, there's a little tiny micro switch right next to it on the throttle linkage and that's probably your issue. Now for the part that we have all been waiting for, we're gonna talk about some KE Jetronic troubleshooting. And I think we're going to start with the most common complaint that I get, which is my car hesitates off the line. 
I would like for you to chime in in the comments if you have like a 300E or a 190E 2.6, a 420 or 560 SEL. When you stab the gas pedal instead of the car going, it chokes out. So we have to make a couple of assumptions here. First of all, we have to assume that one, you don't have any major vacuum leaks. If you have Let's take this plenum boot, which is, is trash. Let's say you have a leaking plenum boot or um, uh, like your plenum boot around here where it attaches the throttle valve is collapsing or you, God forbid, have a tear in your plenum boot or those giant idle air hoses that attach to the injectors are broken. Like you actually have one that's split open you're gonna have some problems, but let's assume that you don't. This is something that most people are going to rack their brain over because they don't understand what this problem is. Why is it when you accelerate KE Jetronic injected Mercedes, the car falls flat on its face and is real sluggish, show about 20 miles an hour, then all of a sudden it magically recovers and then it seems to have normal levels of power. Here's where we are gonna get started. So. Let's talk about the EHA adjustment first, and then we're gonna talk about the pressure measuring system because I want you guys to understand the adjustment since not everybody's going to have access to pressure gauges. This is the back of an EHA. This is the part that faces up against the fuel distributor, just like this. It's held in place with two screws. But when you take it off, you're gonna see this. You're gonna see these two inlet and outlet holes, sorry, two inlet and outlet holes and the two screw holes and down in the bottom here, you're gonna see this little screw. Is this an adjustment screw? No, it's not. It's a screw that hides an adjustment. What is the adjustment? Well, let's say we pull the screw and look in this little tiny hole. I'm gonna to try to find my camera. Do you, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Hey Siri, turn on the flashlight. It's on. Okay. Let's see if I can backlight my, my way. Come on, where are you? Oh, there we go. You guys see the little two millimeter Allen screw in there? Oh yeah. So this is the genesis of where this problem is. Flashlight off. It's off. Okay. What do we do with this little two millimeter Allen? Well, if you have a car that is stumbling off the line and you know you don't have any major vacuum leaks, you take this little guy and you turn in counterclockwise. You take your little two millimeter Allen and you turn the screw in one quarter of a turn. Don't start screwing it all the way in and out. Screw it one quarter of a turn in. What that does is it increases the pressure differential between working pressure and control pressure. What am I saying? You're about to find out. But the mechanics of it is this. You simply pull the EHA off, Maybe change the O-rings between the EHA and the fuel distributor. Make sure your EHA is not leaking from these two little manufacturing holes here. There are two little holes right here. Make sure that it's not weeping fuel. Remove the screw right here, the little tiny flathead screw. Don't lose the washer. There's actually a ceiling washer under that screw that's like, three millimeters in diameter. It's not a big washer. And then adjust. And you might have to make one more adjustment, but it should eradicate your, your off the line performance issue. But there's a more precise way to do this. And so that's why we brought the fuel pressure gauges. Okay, so. I don't have my connections with me. I could not find them today because my shop looks like a war zone. But 
you're going to want to take, let's look at our fuel pressure gauges real quick. These are my nice fuel pressure gauges. If you're wondering where I got these, I got them from bomb tools like seven years ago and they have done a, they have been a heck of a, heck of a resource. So with our fuel pressure gauges, we have the fitting that goes directly to the gauge. So we, we're going to go from here to here to here through this coil of line. And then we're going to go to the gauge. And then on the other end, we've got this thing that has a shutoff valve in it. The shutoff valve can be turned on and off. It's like a little water faucet. So when you attach these to your car, I want the valve off. The valve needs to be off. Now, first of all, you're going to take this end, the end that goes straight into the pressure gauge, and you're going to find a port on the bottom of your fuel distributor. Where is that port? Let's see here. All right, you're gonna take by the, I think it's by the return side, I can't remember, but let's use our, our 560 fuel distributor as our model here. I'm gonna go to the, the passenger side. Okay, so I'm gonna find this 12 millimeter plug right here in the bottom little little hard to see i know but you see this 12 millimeter plug right here i'm going to attach this fitting to this 12 millimeter plug and that again that's going to go directly to our gauge then i'm going to take this fitting right here closed. We have one gauge that's going to be going into the bottom. One gauge that's going to be going, one part that's going to be going into the into the top. Kind of awkward, I know. And we're going to start with the valve closed and we're going to take a reading on this gauge. So let's say you have a, a uh, 560 uh, a 560 SL or SEL. On this gauge, I know this gauge is a little hard to see. I'm gonna to wanna to see a reading right here is, is 6.0 bar. I'm gonna to wanna to see a reading with the valve closed of about 6.3 bar, about, maybe 6.4. Then I'm going to do this. I'm going to open this valve and the reading on the gauge is going to change. And the reading is actually going to drop down to about 5.9. So let's do this. Hold on. I'm going to grab a sheet of paper. So you're going to do this. You're going to take All right, so let's say we have a reading with the valve uh, with the valve closed and a reading with the valve open. By the way, you really want to do this in bar because in PSI, it just wasn't designed to be done in PSI. These are Germans. They use precise indicators of measurement. Valve open, we're going to say that we get 5.9. I know this is backwards, but anyway, that's cool. If we we're going to subtract, 
So we're going to subtract um, 5.9 from 6.3, and that's going to give us 0.4 bar. 0.4 bar is the difference that you want. But, well, actually, I should, I should talk about this more. The difference between control and working pressure on a perfectly functioning KE Jetronic system is 0.4 bar. That means that the pressure that is being fed to the system and the pressure that's being fed to the injectors should have a difference at idle of about uh, at idle speed. The car is just going to be at idle speed. You don't need to be driving the car. Just at idle speed is fine. It should have a difference of 0.4 bar. And that is with the electrohydraulic actuator unplugged. So you should disconnect it from the harness when you take this reading. When you plug it back in, you're going to get readings of 0.3 to 0.35 bar. But we're going to get to that in a second. Now, I know this is kind of a tough thing to wrap your head around. I know it's new to a lot of you guys, but just please bear with me because this is some stuff that, you know, I, I try to run these presentations like they're a doctorate level class, not an entry level 1000, 1000 level basic math class. Ideal world, okay? The difference between the, the upper and lower chamber, valve open, valve closed, 0.4 bar perfect world that is the number you need to be shooting for now a lot of the time because of the effects of age or how the cars were set up for u.s emissions or or whatever when i unplug the eha and i take a pressure reading i get a difference of 0.3 bar or 0.25 bar and this is a lean running condition and if your car has it it will cause it to stumble so Let's say I take a pressure reading on a, let's say I have the same type of car, 560 SL, and I get a reading with the valve open of, sorry, I get a reading with the valve closed of 6.3 bar, which would be right about here in red. Let's say I get a reading of 6.3. And then when I close the valve, my needle goes back to 6.0 bar, 6.0. So 6.3 closed. Always take your closed reading first, okay? And 6.0 open. So the difference between these is 0.3 bar. That is going to cause a lean running condition. And lean running conditions cause stumbling and poor acceleration and lack of power and sometimes even starting difficulties. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my electrohydraulic actuator that's all set up for the adjustment here. I'm gonna remove the screw and I'm gonna go in one quarter turn Put it back on the car. You're going to have to reinstall it after this, of course. Put it back on the car and then recheck my pressures again. And with the electrohydraulic actuator disconnected, unplugged, make sure this thing is unplugged, you're going to get a reading of you want, you want your, your lower number to go lower. That is what you're looking for. So Instead of 6.0 on the open, you're looking for 5.9. So your lower number, your valve open number is the one that's going to drop. Um, now, one of the other really interesting things about the system is that occasionally it can run rich. Now, rich running does not occur unless somebody has tampered with the electrohydraulic actuator, or unless there's like a, a major blockage in the injectors or a major blockage in the fuel return. But let's say I have a reading of, let's say I buy a car that I've never seen before. Let's say I buy a 1990 SL. And I take my upper reading and it's, it's my valve closed reading is 6.7 bar. 
and my valve open reading is 6.1 bar. And if I subtract 6.1 from 6.7, I'm going to get 0.6. That is a really rich running system. I mean, this thing is going to be fouling its plugs and choking and everything. Most people would go to the oxygen sensor. It's not the oxygen sensor. This is going to be one of three things. One, you have blocked injectors. Two, you have a blocked fuel return. Or three, somebody has tampered with the EHA. I know some people would say fuel pressure regulator. But the thing about fuel pressure regulators is they very rarely open too late. Usually the problem is that they open too early or they dump fuel pressure. They do not, do not, do not usually, like we're talking about 99 times out of 100, retain too much pressure in the system. By the way, the maximum permissible pressure is like 7.0. But really, you want to see 6.5, 6.6 as your maximum. I like to see 6.4, 6.5. But anyway, if you have this pressure differential, 0.6, the first thing you need to do is verify that your injectors are not blocked and verify that your fuel return is clear. If you verify those two things, then with your electrohydraulic actuator, you're going to go back to the little two millimeter Allen, and you're gonna back it up one quarter of a turn. Don't go more than a quarter of a turn. Why? Because you need to see if there's an improvement here on the gauge. Now you can buy these gauges all over the internet. If you Google Mercedes KE Jetronic pressure test gauge or, or KE Jetronic pressure test gauge, there are all kinds of gauges for sale. There's one from SNG Tool Source or tooldiscounter.com for like $99. It's not a very good one, but it gets the job done. This fancy schmancy unit from Bomb Tools cost me about $200 seven years ago. I think it's about the same amount of money. There's absolutely no reason to not be able to get one of these. And it's cheaper to buy the gauge than pay a mechanic oftentimes who does not know what they are doing. Anyway, that's it for the EHA adjustments. Let's look at a couple of other weird scenarios with KE Jetronic. So the one that I really love is the idle. The idle that is going up and down, up and down, or the idle that is stumbling. This is the idle mixture adjustment. And a lot of the time, this is just a simple three millimeter Allen screw. You go in and out. A lot of the time people like to overcomplicate this adjustment. I'm gonna make it really simple for you. Adjust the car to where it has the smoothest idle, the best starting and does not stumble off the line. That is a happy KE Jetronic Mercedes. So let's say you have an idle that's going up and down, an idle that's just really shaky. Verify that none of your vacuum lines are disconnected or broken. Verify that you have healthy spark plugs and a good ignition system first. And then it does not hurt to try to adjust that three millimeter Allen. I see so many cars in my shop where I'm like, People call me and they're like, I can't get my Mercedes to idle properly. Okay, well, what did the last mechanic do? Did he adjust the three millimeter Allen? And guess what they say? Oh, he was really afraid of adjusting that thing. He didn't want to touch it. He was too scared to touch it. Why? You could just reverse whatever adjustment you've made. It's really easy, you know? So I tell them, I'm like, adjust this thing gently and slowly and see if there's an improvement in the car's idle. Usually an improvement in the idle, usually but not always. Usually an improvement in the idle will yield an improvement in acceleration and an improvement in starting, but this will give you the smoothest idle. I rest my case. Okay, so here's another one. And this is particularly after you've installed a rebuilt fuel distributor, or you're dealing with a mystery car that will not start. I expect that some of you on this thread have adopted Mercedes 
that are or have been sitting for a long time. We're going to talk about setting up the amount of free play in the airflow sensor plate. So this is the airflow sensor plate. Let me tilt this down, tilt this back. We're going to talk about the free play. In this plate, before you hit pressure from the fuel distributor, okay, we're talking about free play and then, oh, it's really hard to push down. In this plate, you want between one and three millimeters of free play. And that is going to help you start a non-running car, provided that your EHA is working. And provided that this little guy on the bottom here is set up properly, but we'll get to that in a second. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna crack two or three of these lines just to check for fuel flow. Then you're going to jump the fuel pump relay. If you looked at my last presentation, terminals 87 and 30 on the pump relay or 87 and 15 will give you constant fuel flow. And what you want to do is you want to crack the two or three of these lines. And then you want to adjust. You can actually adjust uh, your CO2 mixture screw to give you free play. So if I go counterclockwise, it's going to give me more free play in the air in the in the airflow meter plate. And this only works by the way if you have a fully pressurized fuel distributor on top of it. So I'm just using this as a demo, but you want that that 2 to 3 millimeters. You want just barely a little bit of play. Now, why is this? It's so the right amount of air can actually flow into the engine when it's idling, so it's not too rich, and so it doesn't choke itself out with fuel. This is the, that's why they call this the air-fuel ratio adjustment. They also call it a CO2 adjustment or an idle mixture adjustment. I've used those terms before as well. But if you screw it in, you will reduce the amount of play. So let's say that you have like six millimeters of play before you hit pressure. That's too much. The car is never going to run. It will only run if this thing is adjusted with one somewhere between one and three millimeters of play. And even then you're not guaranteed that the car will start and run. So this is a very fine, very, yeah, okay, I see that, Greg, but sometimes it's three millimeters, okay? Anyway, if there are any know-it-alls on the uh, on the chat, I recommend that you let people who actually have questions ask their questions. Uh, the three millimeters, the three millimeters of play is not the final setting. It's just a home base. If you can get between one and three millimeters, the car will probably start and run. May not start and run great, but once it starts and runs and will idle, you can adjust this thing to get the best amount of air and fuel together to get the car to idle like it's supposed to and start like it's supposed to. But again, one to three millimeters, and then it doesn't hurt with your it doesn't hurt with your fuel pump running to press down on the flap. Look, it's magic pulling it down, not really. And see if all three, I mean, all six or all eight pots start delivering fuel. Which brings me to my next question, my next, my next topic, the dead mist. What do you do if you have a dead mist? Well, you can start cracking injection lines while the engine is idling and making sure after you wiggle the line a little bit that all six or all eight or all four pots on your fuel distributor have fuel delivery. You can also pull your spark plugs and, and check on those. And if you have good, you know, good spark and it seems like each spark plug is working, all six pots or all eight pots need to have equal fuel delivery. This is why when you're rebuilding a fuel distributor, you need a flow bench to make sure that everybody's getting the same amount of fuel. You can't have a cylinder that's running super lean. You will ruin that cylinder eventually. Eventually. It takes a lot to kill a Mercedes, but eventually it will. Okay, now let's look at another scenario. This is particularly common on, let's look at the failed over voltage relay scenario. 
This is a really common problem that I get, especially on V8 gas Mercedes, but it adversely affects six cylinder Mercedes as well. So the V8 gas Mercedes uh, uses this to power up the idle air valve control unit, the idle air valve relay. And if this thing fails, you're gonna get a racing idle of 1500 RPM or so, and you're gonna get an ABS light. This is on 420, 560 variants. And again, if the OVP goes down, you're gonna get a racing idle and you're gonna get an ABS light. You need to verify that your ABS light actually works and you need to verify that somebody has not taken this thing and tried to use it as an idle speed adjustment. I always say, follow the rabbit hole with the three millimeter Allen adjuster. Adjust the thing till you get the highest idle. Even if that idle is screaming at 1500 RPM, adjust it till you get the highest idle. Don't stop. This is not an idle speed adjustment. If your mixture wants to give you a 1500 RPM idle, there's something else wrong. But you need to adjust this till you get the highest idle. Because when you get the highest idle, it means that the air fuel mixture is the happiest it could be. But I found that a lot of the time this goes down, idiot mechanics adjust this to try to get the idle speed down and they pull the ABS light bulb at the same time because they don't know what's making that ABS light come on. So you need to make sure that the ABS light is actually working. You need to make sure that the idle mixture is actually uh, adjusted properly. And then if you get a screaming idle and an ABS light replace over voltage relay. And again, that's on V8 cars. Now we're going to talk about the OVP failure scenario on a six cylinder car or a four cylinder car. So 190, 300, 260, et cetera. This is a very different scenario. Number one, the car will be extremely difficult to start. Crank, 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 crank. Number two, you're gonna have a very weak idle. Engine's gonna idle around 500 RPM. Three, you, you may not have... Hey, Pierre, your sound went out. You're on your own. There's no indicator light to tell you when your OVP is bad or not. So again, weak idle, uh, difficult starting from cold, probably bad gas mileage. Check your over voltage relay. Sometimes even the connection can go bad or the fuses in the top can go bad. Now let's look at difficult warm starting. Difficult warm starting can be can stem from two things. It can stem from a bad accumulator. Occasionally it can stem from a bad fuel pressure regulator too, but it'll usually stem from a bad accumulator or it'll stem from a lean mixture. Sometimes, now I'm I'm not breaking my own my own rule here, but sometimes if I have a car where I know that I have good vacuum and the car idles, idles well and starts well, and my accumulator seems to be good and I'm not losing any pressure. Even if my pressure test for the EHA is okay, I'm getting a, a 0.4 bar difference with the EHA unplugged. I, I still want just a little bit better starting. I can tweak this like an eighth or a 16th of a turn and it may actually improve my starting. So you may be suffering from what I call a lean starting condition. The reason is that when you start the car, this guy sends an enrichment signal to this guy to open up a little more. So we get a little bit extra, a little bit of extra fuel. But the quick and dirty test for a bad accumulator is to push on the plunger. If the plunger has lost pressure after two or three hours, there's nobody home, it just does what then that means that you have a bad accumulator or or otherwise 
Now, um, failed KE control units, while they are really rare, even if your oxygen sensor is new, you might get a check engine light. Let's say you're, there's a four pin or a two pin engine temperature sensor, depending on which version you have. I find that the four pin sensor that was used starting in 1987 or 88, depending on whether you have a California or federal version car, will occasionally, uh, you know, occasionally cause a check engine light when it goes bad. But a lot of the time, if you start getting random check engine lights, the car starts stalling for no reason, even though all other variables are good. You may have a bad KE control unit. I've had a blown up one cause a 1991 300 SL to not shift into fifth gear. So this also provides some fifth gear regulation for the, the 1990 and 91 722 dot, 1990 to 92 722.5 automatic. So, but usually I give these guys the benefit of the doubt. They're extremely tough. Usually we have power supply issues. Next, we're gonna talk about O2 sensor problems. Usually a check engine light doesn't necessarily indicate the O2 sensor is bad, but I always say with oxygen sensors, if you do not know the mileage on your oxygen sensor, get it out and put a new one in. I see so many 200 thousand mile cars with original oxygen sensors. It's crazy. We have to replace as many oxygen sensors as we do spark plugs. And, you know, I feel like that's a common problem with these cars. And so if your O2 sensor is, is bad, replace it. I will say that in the early R129 cars, be really careful about the oxygen sensor plug. It's on the inside of the transmission tunnel. And it's a real nightmare to deal with. So please, please, please be very careful about that plug. All right, next we're going to talk about uh, one last thing, which is idle air valve adjustments on V8 cars. This is something that ties into our discussion of vacuum leaks as well. So, you know, you have, you have several areas where, where vacuum leaks can be an issue. You have your injector seals and holders where these Injector lines terminate in the cylinder head. There's going to be both a plastic holder with an O-ring on it and a seal underneath the injector itself. Don't let these things get hard and baked. You've also got these vacuum hoses that go into the idle air valve. Try to replace them if they're hard and baked. I replace a lot of these. And then there are the air logs and the air distribution hoses that run underneath that's why they have this this cutout here underneath and alongside the injectors and usually i don't mess with those things unless they're absolutely rock solid finally on the bottom of the fuel distributor there's supposed to be an o-ring here if that o-ring goes bad replace it and last we're going to talk about this plenum boot now the plenum boots get really hard over the years and there are a bunch of vacuum connections down there. So this makes them really scary to replace. I say with plenum boots, don't replace a plenum boot unless you are ready to go all the way, pull your whole injector assembly, because as you can see, this thing really is extremely intense the way it mounts. You need to make sure that this lip seals all the way around. And instead of using Mercedes original hose clamp with a bunch of strapping on it, I usually use a, I don't, I don't get a generic clamp. I get this Norma 70 to 90 millimeter clamp from Mercedes. But this was actually a messed up plenum boot that did not seal right here. And at the end of the day, I was forced to trash it, even though it was a brand new part from Mercedes, there was nothing I could do with it. So remember that don't just assume everything. I see so many people who strip all their vacuum stuff away, get it over their head and end up with a huge mess on their hands because they, they don't, they, they put one vacuum hose together wrong. The other thing I will warn you about is with vacuum line connections in these cars, you need a 4.2 or 5.6 M116, M117 engine manual or an M103 engine manual 
or an M104 engine manual to make sure you get all your vacuum line connections right. There's one in particular that I think uh, can be a big problem, but we'll, we'll talk about this in a later presentation. I just wanted to touch on it though. On the right side of the fuel distributor, right about here, there, there's going to be a big vacuum line on the intake manifold. Make sure it is not leaking because it is huge and it will cause a plethora of issues. Okay, so now that you have a KE system that is running right, once it's accelerating well and, 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 and behaving normally and everything, you're going to want to adjust a couple of things. You're going to want to make sure that you have perfect idle speed. And the perfect idle speed talk is our last troubleshooting point, and then I'm going to take questions. Now, I always go to this potentiometer and I check pins one and two while they are plugged in with the plug removed, and I'm looking for somewhere between 0.5 and 0.9 volt. The ideal number is 0.7 volt. So pins one and two, about 0.7 volt, 0.5 is okay, 0.9 is okay. You don't want it to go over one volt, but you want the voltage between these two pins to be 0.5, 0.7, Once you're done, let's say you have an M116 or 117 engine, a 420 or a 560, and you cannot get your idle speed low enough. You want it to be like 550 in drive, 700 in park. But let's say you're getting 850, 900, 950 in park, and you don't have any major vacuum leaks, and you put it in drive, and you're like 650 or or something like that. I'm going to show you guys the idle air valve adjustment. And this is fresh information. You won't even find it anywhere on the internet except maybe like, you know, on the 500E board. But in here, it's hard to see. In here is a threaded pin, internally threaded pin. It has a four millimeter by 0.5 millimeter thread or 0.75 millimeter thread. If you screw a screw in here and then put the screw in your vise and then tap the pin away, thus pulling the sleeve out, you're actually pulling the sleeve out, you will lower your idle speed. And one millimeter corresponds to approximately 50 to 75 RPM. But this is the idle speed adjustment on V8 cars. And many people have purchased new idle air valves without realizing that they can actually adjust these to get the idle speed lower. So if you have a, a V8 car where you know that everything is working right and your idle is still too high, you can make an adjustment. And when you're in there, always replace these hoses and replace the little buffer that mounts the thing in place. So good. All right. So in general with KE Jetronic, you want a car that starts well, idles well, has consistent pickup with no stumbling or hesitation, no black smoke. Fuel economy on V8 cars should be between 15 and 20 miles per gallon. On six cylinder cars, it should be between 18 and 25 miles per gallon. On four cylinder cars, it should be between 19 and, and 20, 29 miles per gallon, depending on what transmission you have. What you really want is a car that runs well and drives well. So I know that there are some extra items in here that I didn't cover, like on-off ratio, troubleshooting the X11 socket. For, for those of you who have a lot of great information, uh, this is all stuff that I would like to cover. And if any of you need individual coaching with it, please reach out to me. But if all the systems that I gave you are working right and you can adjust the car and get a smooth idle and a nice start, even if you don't get perfect diagnostic numbers right off the start, give the system some time to adjust itself because it's pretty smart and it will figure things out. All right, so um, Anne-Marie, I will now take questions if everybody hasn't gone to sleep yet. And we'll see if we can help some people with their various issues that nobody has been able to help them with. Okay, we had a couple. 
We had a couple questions early on. Um, the first one was from Devlin. Devlin has a 1989 R107 that runs really well, 80,000 kilometers, but there's a fuel smell when parked and looks to be fuel residual around the EHA and backside of the fuel distributor. Planning to replace O-rings, but do you have any additional recommendations? Yeah, the O-rings never leak, actually. They, they very rarely leak. If I were him, I would replace my EHA. Just put a new one on. You may have to do some fine tuning even on a new one, but your EHA is probably the issue. Thanks, Pierre. Great. And then uh, next question. The next question was from Curdy. Can a single pump car be converted to a dual pump configuration? No. It, it, it can, yeah, but it's a lot of work. I mean, you have to get the right bracket and you have to, there, there's actually a wiring harness um, connector so, so the, the wiring harness from the fuel pump relay is about the same, but the gauge of wiring was a little bigger. <coughs> and then there was a wiring connector, if I remember right, underneath the car's back seat that branched off wiring for the extra fuel pump. So yes, you can convert it, but you're gonna need a different fuel distributor and a different fuel pressure regulator and a different KE control unit I think you get the picture, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the factory did it with no major modification. So I guess you can do it too. One relay though, that we didn't discuss is the MAS relay, which is a fuel pump relay come uh, AC control relay. Mercedes combined the Klima relay and the, the, uh, the fuel pump relay into one unit. So these were used on 124, 201 and 126 series cars starting in 1990 up to 1992. If you guys have any questions about the MAS, you can include them here. Um, what is our next question, Anne-Marie? Our next question that we had, and I'm going in the order in which you received them. The next question was from Ozcan. He has a 1995-60 SEL. Uh, he okay. wants, uh, Ozcan wants to know, can an OVP relay send an OK signal to the idle control valve, but a wrong signal to ABS, so the ABS light comes on? Or after... Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, and the answer is no. The pin that powers up the, um, the ABS and the pin that powers up, not the idle control valve, but the idle control valve relay, which is underneath your, underneath your false floor, is the, same, is the same pin. The only way that this could happen is if you actually have physical damage at the pin connector at your wiring harness. So if you do believe that that is your issue and you have an, a not so nice car, a car that's been tampered with or a car that may have had like some rodents living in it, which I, I doubt you do, but I'm, I'm just saying this for general information. You really want to start troubleshooting at the plug itself rather than at the OVP. However, it doesn't hurt to just buy an OVP. You can even buy it, even though I, I say that the genuine Mercedes unit, which is made by Stribal, is the best one. If you buy a Kaler unit, it's going to work. It's going to work for two or three years. You know, spend the 50 bucks on one and, and troubleshoot it and, and just make sure. As a follow-up to that question, Oskan asks, or after brake fluid flush or change, there is a tiny air bubble left in the system because sometimes while the ABS light is on, the brake pedal kicks back gently and the ABS light goes off. You know, that is not, that is, that does not, probably does not have anything to do with the OVP unit. It sounds like the ABS system is actually working. Um, at some point, I'd like for myself or someone to do a workshop on Bosch ABS, but I would tell Ozken to pull his front brake sensors and clean the stators, clean the dust off the stators where the sensor reads the wheel speed. This is something that almost nobody does, and it often is responsible for this strange pulse back issue. Um, what is our next question? Our next question is from Curdy again. Curdy asks, you mentioned fuel distributor rebuilding. Uh, I have a 315,000 miles on a 300 SEL, and the distributor has never been touched. Should I be considering this as a maintenance item? No, it's not a maintenance item. 
That's a silly, well, I'm not gonna say it's a silly question. It's a good question because this is a question people need to know the answer to. Don't rebuild a fuel distributor unless you have uh, inconsistent fuel delivery um, or a, an external leak or, or something that's actually wrong with it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Excellent. And we have a question from the head honcho, Jerry. Oh, dear. Jerry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jerry wants to know what are the characteristics of a bad fuel diaphragm pressure regulator on a KG jet system, KE jet okay. system? Well, so I guess he's referring to the, the, the fuel pressure regulator on the discharge side. Hopefully, Jerry's not trying to bait me. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, these things don't go bad that often. I have to preface this. I've replaced them on a few cars, but there are three characteristics that I'm going to tell you about. The first one is that I've had one scenario where the system was not dumping enough pressure and it actually caused this little adjusting screw, which adjusts the moment of delivery on the, on the bottom of the fuel distributor to start backing out. So that's one characteristic. If you have a fuel distributor where the delivery point keeps changing to the point where it eats up your one to three millimeter of play and your one to three millimeters of play start disappearing and then eventually you're gone and you have no free play or you have to have no free play in order to get the car to start you may want to look at your your fuel pressure regulator occasionally these can leak down it's not that common um, and occasionally, if there are contaminants in your fuel system, the pressure regulator may regulate too high, but it's, it's pretty rare for that to happen. I see a lot of mistaken scenarios where people blame a fuel pressure regulator on blocked injectors or a blocked fuel return because both will raise both the control and working pressure numbers past their factory specification. So in that case, don't blame the fuel pressure regulator. Try to determine what the real issue is. Okay, what is our next question? Our next question is also from GBZ. He asks, do you see gasoline with ethanol damaging fuel system components such as the EHA? Yes. Yeah, I, I do. Um, with the EHA, I think it really eats up the plastic casing around the solenoid inside the EHA. and. I think we, we know that cars that are not used regularly, that's the key word. Ethanol does its, its greatest harm when the car is not used. Um, if you're using the car all the time, even though Larry Fletcher says that ethanol is the worst stuff on the planet for these cars, I haven't necessarily found that to be true. I mean, I, I feed our 190E on a steady diet of regular 10% ethanol, 93 octane, and I've not had any fuel distributor issues so far. But on cars that have sat, uh, you know, I would say about one in every four or five fuel distributor failures are related to ethanol contamination. Um, okay, next question. Next question is from Bruce. Bruce asks, please discuss injectors, i.e. leak down, periodic replacement, spray quality, et cetera. Okay, great. Um, so the injectors are nothing more than, than pop valves. They're, they're designed to start opening at around 40 PSI. I have found that most injectors do suffer some form of leak down as they age. I've also found that their spray patterns, particularly when there are contaminants in there, stop being perfect. So they should sort of spray like a misting shower head or a misting, you know, garden hose sprayer. If you get a bias where they're spraying from one side to the other, or you get a steady stream, or you get little drips right before the moment of opening, or after you release pressure, if there's 40 PSI in the line and they keep dripping down, then, uh, you know, you may want to replace them. But I, I think that most of the time, these injectors are pretty stout. I think that a lot of people jump to replace them before they're necessarily bad. And I would say that on a car that you're getting, the, these are the outward symptoms of injector issues. 
you get a, a slightly difficult, not a super difficult, but a slightly difficult and rough hot start. You get a, um, you, you might have, you might have funny exhaust emissions um, on cars that have bad injectors, even though everything else seems to be perfect. You ruled everything out. Your differential pressures are good. Your fuel distributor is good. Your spark plugs are good. And you have a higher mileage car that's giving you shaky pressures. I would say that, that you may want to look at injectors, but more importantly, look at injector seals and injector holders, because that's where some of the major vacuum leaks occur. So I would, I would definitely look there for problems first. But I think that injector replacement is almost overrated. I mean, we have a bunch of 200,000 mile cars driving around with, uh, with in original injectors. The moral of the story is there are probably things that are more pressing than injectors. For example, people will often throw a set of eight $40 injectors at a at a 560 SL that has weak power off the line when they should have just adjusted their EHA. People often blame injectors for problems that are not caused by the injectors. And that's, that's mostly my argument here, that you should not rush to blame injectors when you actually need to do some real diagnostics on your pressure differentials and on vacuum leaks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next question. Next question is another one from Ozcan. Do you recommend using fuel stabilizers or Tecron fuel system cleaner or injection cleaner specifically for cars that are not driven regularly? Oh boy, you know, you need to be careful with that stuff because sometimes it can cause more harm than good. I remember we had a car come in with BG44 fuel additive and it destroyed everything from the fuel pumps which were leaking externally to the fuel distributor. I would say if you're not driving your car regularly, unless you live in a state like California where somebody decided that selling ethanol-free gas was a bad idea, put ethanol-free gas in your car. You can add stable. Stable is fine. I wouldn't say start adding fuel additives. Uh, the, the least invasive fuel additive I found that actually works is Lucas fuel injector cleaner. So if you, if you need something, you can use that, but I'm, I'm a big fan of stable, but really ethanol free gas is the ticket. If you don't drive your car much. Next question. That is all we have, unless somebody has any additional questions. Oh, great. Great. Wonderful. Um, wow. Super. Okay. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's about 930. So we've gone for an hour and 24 minutes here. This is a long time. I am going to sign off in about 20 seconds if none of you have any additional questions, but be prepared for our next session, which is going to be DJtronic. And before we go, I want to plug two things. I want to plug my buddy Aviv's new YouTube series called New Versus Old. It's N-E-W-V-S-O-L-D, one word on YouTube. Please check it out. It's a great channel. I really love watching it. And the second thing is that if you guys are NBCA members, I really need to see member recruitment. I mean, our club is like really suffering from low membership numbers. I really want to see more classic Mercedes owners getting into our club. So please, like if you know somebody that has Mercedes and they're passionate about these cars and not an MBCA member, get them to join MBCA, please. Anyway, um, I think that's about it. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Again, our next session is DJtronic, which is 1970 to 75, computer controlled injection. And um, we're going to be looking forward to seeing you guys. Thank you. Okay, and before we sign off officially, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, like Pierre said, he has the Bosch diesel, diesel injection systems uh, presentation set for September 24th. 
um, that's in two weeks from now. But before that, next Thursday, I am actually presenting a class, uh, part one of our how to uh, show your car at a concourse. Part one goes over what is a concourse, uh, judging standards, what goes on at a show, all of that stuff. It's, uh, you can go to our website for more details. That's mbca.org slash upcoming hyphen SMC hyphen events to see all of their social media committee upcoming events. Um, once again, thank you all for joining. And if you have oh, any- Oh guys, one, one more thing I wanna say. Anne Marie's class is going to be great because she is Miss Legends of the Autobahn. I mean, I would not want to have to deal with, I, I guess if I were dealing with a judging situation or question, she's the person that I would want there to, would want to be there because she is, she is like, um, I don't know. She's like our, our, our concourse lawyer or something. <laughs> anyway, we need better judging in this club because I want, I want to see people aiming for a higher standard with their cars. Yes. Uh, I am working on a judging class it, that goes in conjunction with our concourse class. The concourse class that I put together, uh, I presented along with Jeff Wong. Um, a lot of you guys may know him on the 500 e board as Capdruff. Um, he's a very exper experienced concourse um, entrant. He's won Best of Show twice uh, at Legends with different cars. So we created this class uh, trying to get younger people, more people into showing their cars at a concourse by demystifying the whole process. So um, if you guys are free next Thursday at five uh, Pacific nine, uh, what is that? Eight Eastern, sorry. <laughs> Uh, we will be presenting that class here on Zoom and the uh, Zoom info will be going out next week. So once again, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next week. Bye.